The clock is ticking. Slowly but surely, Windows 7 support is coming to an end. Now, some of you might be wondering why I still even use Windows 7. Well, I'll get to that. Others might be thinking that Windows 7 hasn't been officially supported since January 2020. But you see, some Windows 7 users managed to figure out how to get extended updates until January 2023, kind of like how Windows XP managed to get extended updates until 2019 through similar means. Now, as for why I'm still on Windows 7? Well... Okay, let's face it, by all accounts, Windows 7 was the last good Windows operating system. Whether it's because it wasn't filled with advertisements in your start menu, or apparently your file browser now, wasn't full of spyware, or because it didn't force update your system with untested updates that could at times break everything, reset your default programs, and... Okay, look, I know people are going to ask why not Windows 10, well, that's why. And I think Windows 11 is even worse with all of that stuff. As a matter of fact, while writing this video, I learned that apparently you won't be able to set up Windows 11 without a Microsoft account anymore, and they're also planning on putting ads into the File Explorer. That's right, ads in the File Explorer. Yeah, stuff like that creeps me out, honestly. I'm sure you'll be able to bypass it somehow, but they'll probably start bugging you about it again the moment you connect to the internet. Also, up until very recently, Windows 7 was still supported by a lot of programs. It still is, mind you, but recently I've been noticing more and more programs dropping support for some reason or another. So if I'm not going to use a newer Windows version, what will I use? Well, it's probably going to be Linux. Now, Linux is its own set of issues, but I think once you get it working, it will work. Besides, my Windows 7 install is very stitched together as it is. And yes, I'm well aware of the irony of making this video despite rather recently making a brief video complaining about Linux. So let's see just what will be needed to switch, starting with hardware. Aver Media Capture Card. Now apparently my Aver Media Capture Card will work just fine on Linux, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Drawing Tablet Despite the fact I rarely draw, I think having the drawing tablet working is a good idea. Now, my Wacom tablet isn't officially supported, which isn't the best sign in the world, but I found third-party drivers which will hopefully work. That's not to say anything of the actual software I'd be using it with, but we'll... get to that. Game Controllers Game controller support has actually come quite a ways. Even several years ago, I was able to easily get game controllers installed on Linux just fine, so I wouldn't be surprised if this works more or less right out of the box. GPU Now, here's where the big issue comes in. I have an RTX 2070 Super graphics card. It's a great card, but the problem is that sometimes I feel like Linux does not like to play nice with Nvidia's drivers, which is part of the reason I made that earlier video, and the open source ones leave a lot to be desired. I get the feeling if I'm going to have any issues with hardware, it's going to be here. Quasi-hardware. Voice meter banana. Now a lot of you might not have heard of this. Well, this is an audio routing tool I use. It's part of how I'm able to separate Discord call audio into a separate audio channel as opposed to having to mix it in with all other desktop audio while still being able to hear it all through my headphones. It's actually really great. However, I'm not sure Linux has a tool like this, certainly not by default. And since it doesn't run in Linux, I'll either have to be running everything through Wine and just sort of hope that it works, or I'll have to be looking for an alternative which will be... fun. Speaking of which, let's get to software. Most games. Most games should actually be fairly easy to run, since most of them are through Steam, and so most will either already have native Linux support, or support through Proton, with maybe a few exceptions. I'm actually not too worried about this one really. If you're looking to follow and you're concerned about your Steam games for example, just look on ProtonDB. Yes. Now, I use Vegas Pro for my editing needs. It's... uh... Oh, for crying out loud, it crashed again! A program, alright. 
Frankly, the only reason I'd probably continue using this on Linux is because I've been using it almost exclusively for years now, and because most of my old project files are for Vegas 2. Of course, then there's the issue that Vegas Pro won't work natively on Linux. Wine might have to come to the rescue, if that's possible, but more on that in a minute. However, the only truly good video editors out there are Vegas Pro, Adobe Premiere, and maybe DaVinci Resolve. But even that has its own limitations. But there is another. Recently, I heard about Caden Live, which is a free professional video editing program. Uh-huh, right. Let me guess. It'll be okay enough, maybe full of crashes, perhaps it'll have a handful of the features the others have. Oh wait, it has pretty much everything I want. I mean, yeah, the layout is different, but otherwise it's pretty good. But you know what's been a thorn in my side for years with Vegas? It can't import MKVs. At least my version can't. I wonder if Caden Live will be able to... Oh, wow, it can. Well, okay, what about X265 videos? Not even Premiere can do that without seriously struggling. Hmm, I'll bet they won't have... <sighs> Wow, they have it! Uh, wow. Okay, Caden Live can do it. Sure, the playback isn't perfect, but it's way better than anything else I've used, and Vegas can't even do that to begin with. And it's available on both Windows and Linux. Oh, yeah, and Mac too if you care about that. So the only downside I've reached at this point is that I won't be able to open my old Vegas Pro files, which we'll get to. But man, where has this editing program been for so long? This is pretty much perfect. In fact, I just might edit this video in Caden Live. Other games. Now, I'll be honest, most of the games I use, as I mentioned previously, will run just fine. However, some less common games, whether because they're older or just less well known, may not. However, I looked up a couple examples which I play from time to time, those being Sonic Heroes and Tyrion 2000, both with Lutris scripts to be able to play them, so I think I'll be okay in this regard. I mean, even Project 06 I've heard is fairly simple to run using modern tools. The only ones I haven't been able to find are already difficult enough to run on modern Windows. Although, actually, as I was checking for this, I used two examples of difficult to run Windows games, those being The Simpsons Hit and Run and Star Trek Voyager Elite Force. Both of these games have some sort of issue preventing them from running right out of the box on Windows, but hey, The Simpsons has a Lutris script for the modded version of the game, and Star Trek finally got a GOG re-release, though you'll still have to use a Lutris script for that one. Literally the only game I checked for that I couldn't find was Ed, Ed and Eddie The Misadventures, and I couldn't even get that running on Windows. Thanks, DRM! other software. Now there's a slew of other software I use on Windows, but realistically the vast majority of it I've only used a handful of times. Many actually have Linux versions or have suitable alternatives, so I don't have to worry much about those. An easy example is Photoshop. While I'd like to continue using it, and I might spend a little time trying to get it to run, I'm not really sure how big of a deal it will be if I stop. That, and a lot of programs can open .psd files now. Now, on to how I solved some of these things. So while making this video, I decided to mess around with Linux again, specifically opting for Linux Mint, as most people say it's best for Windows users looking to move to Linux with the least hassle possible. First impressions were pretty good, save for one problem. For some reason, on the live USB and upon first boot of the OS proper, the displays are messed up and the mouse is misaligned. Once you fix it after installing Mint, it's fine, but not really the best first impression. Maybe it's because I have multiple monitors, or because they're monitors of different resolutions? So uh, hey Linux Mint developers, if you can figure out what's up with this, it'd be really great to fix that. However, aside from that, I have some good and bad reports of Linux Mint so far. Also, yes, I keep emphasizing I'm using Linux Mint, because if I don't, someone's going to argue how their distro works perfectly fine with zero issues ever, and that it's my fault and I shouldn't blame all of Linux. With that all being said, I'm impressed by how some things worked right out of the box. 
A couple easy examples would be my capture card and my drawing tablet. These worked pretty much the instant they were plugged in, with the only issue being having to capture the audio from the capture card as a separate line in for OBS. Otherwise, I didn't need to install any additional drivers or anything. In fact, pretty much everything hardware related seemed to work perfectly. Next up is the Quasi hardware. As I said, Voice Meter Banana is not available for Linux. I scoured for a while trying to find a solution for this. Many suggested using Jack, which sounded like hell to set up, and some suggested Pipewire. All of this was a bit over my head. For context, these aren't quite programs, more as they're entirely different audio... interfaces? Drivers? Linux Mint uses Pulse Audio by default, and I'd prefer not having to mess with installing anything extra besides that. And then I found it. A program called Pulse Meter, with two E's in the word meter. I actually didn't even run into the program itself, but rather a video about a voice meter alternative for Linux from Linux Gamecast, so they deserve a shout out for that. The program isn't perfect, for example, you have to manually initialize it each boot so that it retains settings, unlike Voice Meter, which automatically launches with everything saved. I'm still not sure I'd recommend this for a giant super complex audio setup, but for what I need it for, it's working perfectly fine. So that's actually a good thing. It seems like that's the more difficult thing out of the way. I'm not saying the rest will be smooth sailing, but this is actually pretty good so far. Finding an alternative to Voice Meter, you know, an already not very common program, was going to be the biggest issue. So, as for software, well, I haven't gotten quite that far yet. Sure, I've installed a few things, but most of that has been experimenting, or stuff that was already native to Linux, such as OBS. Mind you, there are a lot of things that I'm perfectly fine with their Linux alternatives. I'm not so needlessly attached to the Microsoft Office suite that I can't use LibreOffice, for example. Stuff like that's relatively easy. And also Linux Mint had some built-in media player software which works perfectly fine for me. However, I can say that I got Vegas Pro working, sort of. I recorded it how I did it, but there's a couple issues. First of all, you have to install a bunch of dependencies first, then you have to pirate a copy. Yes, really. Because the activation program is broken, you have to use a pirated copy. You'll also have to remove the file IO manager DLL, otherwise it'll crash on boot. And finally, media seems like it has to be imported manually. As in, you can't drag or drop any files in for some reason. But going and importing them through Vegas' file browser works fine? Yeah, I don't get it either. Maybe it's a flat pack limitation? Or maybe it's because I removed that DLL? So what did I use to get this running? Wine, right? Well, sort of. I actually used a program called Bottles to help me install everything. It's not perfect, but considering it's still in development, I'd say it's really good. And yeah, that's basically all that I've done with software so far. I'll leave you guys with some advice on what to do should you choose to follow along, as well as some requests for Linux devs and the community as a whole. So for advice, I'd recommend a couple things. At least in Linux Mint, there's a program built in called TimeShift. Think of it like System Restore on Windows, except actually reliable. Use that before and after installing software or updates, at least at first. If something gets screwed up, it'll save you a lot of hassle. Next, use flat packs. Well, sort of. Some flat packs don't appear to be official, which I'll get to, so if you're wary of putting sensitive information through a flat pack application, make sure to double check that it's legit. I can't confirm whether or not they'd be malicious. For all I know, they're literally just forks of the original program to flat pack, but it never hurts to double check. Why use flat packs though? Well, because they're much more regularly updated than some distros' default packages, they're sandboxed, they have easily customizable permissions with something like Flat Seal, and they reuse dependencies. Okay, so now on to what the Linux community and devs can do to make things easier for newcomers. For starters, can we please have a default audio routing program built in? I'm pretty sure Windows 10 has something like this built into it, even if hardly anyone uses it. Sure, I found something that wouldn't give me a migraine eventually, 
but still, that's something I think many people would like. Next, can a community stop relying so much on command line tutorials? It's rather daunting to a newcomer, and especially now is becoming increasingly unnecessary. I'm not saying to never use the command line, I mean, that's how I installed Pulse Meter, but is it really necessary to teach how to install LibreOffice through the command line when there's an install button? Next, this one goes to the developers of Bottles. I like what you're doing here, though I have one request. When I install a Windows application through Bottles, can it be more integrated into the system, like with menu entries and such? So when I type in Vegas Pro to the program search, it'll show that instead of having to go through Bottles? Or better yet, the file associations being associated to that program. For example, I managed to get Vegas Pro 15... mostly working. But I think it'd be cool to have Vegas Pro run when I open a .veg file. Granted, I know that this might not be doable right now, in part because of limitations in Flatpaks, but it's an idea I'm throwing out there is all. And finally, to the Linux Mint developers. Do you plan on doing something about old packages in the software manager? Again, I'm thinking about all this as a new user, and to a new user, it's a bit strange to go to the equivalent of the App Store, only to find out that you're not even downloading the latest version of the programs you want. Or hell, even Linux Mint didn't come with the latest version of LibreOffice. And again, I know why this is the case. That being because those were the packages approved for the stable release, but I'm sure it's still confusing to many. Well, that's all for now. This journey is certainly going to be an interesting one, and not one that'll happen overnight. It's part of the reason why this is called switching to Linux eventually. I think the hardest part, however, will be a much more personal one. That being a feeling of not quite being at home. This is nothing against Linux Mint. I like the design of it and all, but I've been using Windows 7 since 2012 if I remember correctly. It feels like home to me, sappy as that may sound, and even if and or when I get all of my programs working on Linux Mint, It'll certainly feel off for the first while of consistently using it. To pull from CGP Grey, I'll call it familiar yet foreign. And yes, I know I can make it look nearly identical to my Windows 7 install, but that's besides the point. Maybe once I actually have my documents in place, it'll feel more comfortable. Who knows? In any case, thank you all for watching, and take care.